It's time for our first uh, of our late afternoon talks. It's uh, somebody who hails from Hobart in Tasmania, which is uh, where I'm from before I lived here in Petaluma. Um, Paris Butfield Addison, who is going to allegedly build a video game, train a bot to play it and deploy it on a smartphone in 30 minutes. Please make him welcome. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I, I need an internet connection, so I'm plugging my phone in. Okay, so some of this is a lie because my computer died two days ago and I've had to reconstruct my presentation. So we're going to try as best we can to do this and we'll see how we go. Hello, everyone. I'm Paris. This talk is about very visual machine learning. Okay? There's not a lot of Python in here, but there is some Python. So I hope you'll forgive me. It's not all Python. Now, I'm a professional game developer. I'm not a Python person. Despite having a PhD in computer science, Python still terrifies me and I have no idea how any of it works. I am just feeling my way around Python. So I am primarily working with mostly other languages. I use Python when I need to get something done because it is, because it is usually the best tool for the job, for like data munging, data science, machine learning, stuff like that. As we've heard today, Python is a really great multi-tool. Uh, I love my, my dogs. These are my dogs. You should also love my dogs. Uh, I'm from Hobart, which is where Chris is from. Please don't hold me responsible for Chris. <laughs> We're not all like that. Some of us are, though. Uh, I wrote a lot of books, I built a lot of video games. Uh, this topic is kind of Python adjacent, as I said. We're talking about Unity, which is a video game engine, which I'll come to in a minute. That's C-sharp, which is actually a pretty good language. And then we use Python for the machine learning heavy lifting, which is the machine learning bot side of things. Via TensorFlow, you may have heard of it, it's pretty great. I'm going to talk about three things today. I'm going to talk about Unity, which is a game engine. I'm going to talk about TensorFlow, which is a machine learning framework that comes out of Google. And I'm going to talk about something to glue them together, which is the Unity Machine Learning Agents Toolkit, which I may occasionally refer to as Unity ML Agents, Unity ML, or various other things. All these words are wrong. It is called the Unity Machine Learning Agents Toolkit. They get very angry when you call it something different. Uh, Unity, again, game engine. This is a quick introduction to the power of using a game engine or a simulation engine for machine learning. I think this is really cool, and more people should be doing it. So hopefully you'll get enthused by this. We haven't got time to go too in-depth. First thing I'm going to do is look at Unity. Uh, I'm going to quickly tab out of my slides because I think it's best to do this live because I lost half my slides anyway. So please excuse me while I, while I tab out of my slides in a second. But basically, Unity is a game engine. Unity is 60 to 80% of the video games industry, depending on how you count, which is terrifying. No one company should have that much power, but there you have it. We have that problem. That's our own problem to deal with. But Unity is mostly free, and it's really useful to play with. Uh, it turns out a game engine can simulate enough of the real world to be useful for people who need to simulate the real world or pretend something's in the real world, which is actually quite a fun thing to do. So alongside game engines being a big thing and Unity being a ridiculously terrifying percentage of the games industry, machine learning has really taken off lately in three very specific different domains. Those three domains are cognitive, physical, and visual. So we've got AlphaGo doing cognitive things, solving cognitive problems. We've got uh, DeepMind and like the OpenAI gyms and stuff like that, making things walk with like weird throwing motions and stuff. So physical problems. Uh, and we've got visual problems like VizDoom, where they taught a bot to play Doom just by giving it the visual input of Doom. Okay, Doom is the old video game. So cognitive, physical, visual. Uh, as it turns out, a video game engine can simulate cognitive, physical, and visual things very easily and very quickly. And it's a really good place to do that stuff. So that's where Unity comes in. This is the ML Agents Toolkit. It's on GitHub. We'll come back to that. That slide's just there in case I didn't have an internet connection. Uh, I'm going to tab out now and show you this live just because it's easier. Unity wrote a paper on it. If you want to read more about this from an academic sense, this paper is really good. Unity, a general platform for intelligent agents. It's on archive because every machine learning paper is on archive. It's very, it's very readable. Check it out. Uh, so now it's almost live time time. So I'm going to push escape and go into Unity. Uh, I'm just going to pick the right Unity because I have three of them open to show you three different things. Uh, that's that. <laughs> uh, this one. OK, so ignore those errors. This is Unity. Uh, in Unity, you may think it looks like most other 3D software. Uh, this has nothing to do with machine learning. This is just a scene to acclimatize you with how Unity works. So in this scene, I've put a ball into the scene. It's called Sphere. I'm going to rename it to Ball. You'll see it over here. I've got a cube in the scene, which I've flattened. So you can you know, squish things. I've flattened it. I'm going to call it Floor. And on the ball, I've said, this ball is made up of components. It has a position component, which is called a transform, which is this thing over here. It has a mesh, which is a sphere. It has a mesh renderer, which is the thing that makes the sphere appear in the real world, in the game. And it has a sphere collider and a rigid body. These things make it affected by the physics engine, which Unity ships with. I've also applied a thing called bouncy material to it, which I'll show you in a second. But most importantly, I've ticked this box here, use gravity. 
And uh, that means it'll be affected by gravity, as you'd expect. Now, if I delete this one, because it's a bit of a spoiler, and run this simulation, you'll see the ball falls to the ground, and not much else happens, OK? If I want it to bounce, I need to give it some bounciness. So I've made this bouncy material, which is a thing that says this is bouncy. <laughs> not, much, not much to it. Uh, and it's got bounce combined and maximum, which means every time it bounces, it'll get more bouncy. Very exciting. OK, so I'm going to drag that onto my ball, and I'll show you what happens then. You can probably guess. Right? Very exciting. OK, that's my talk. No, um, this is not machine learning. <laughs> this is nothing to do with machine learning. This is just a cool simulation uh, of a ball that bounces. That ball will eventually bounce off screen, because we told it to multiply its bounce every time. It's very exciting. Hopefully, this really quick example shows you how easy it is to assemble something that would take a little bit more than the 30 seconds I took to build this to code, so you can build it very visually very quickly. So Unity lets you build 3D complicated scenes very, very quickly. And that is why it is interesting for machine learning. So I'm going to switch to a completely different scene now. We've made a little uh, racetrack, which some of you may have seen before. If you saw me speak at PyCon. We've, ma we've made a little racetrack. Uh, it's pretty much what you'd expect. It's a really boring little race course. For the machine learning experts in this room, yes, if we train a car to drive around this track, it will not drive around other tracks very well. It will local maximum problems and all that. That's not the point. The point is to show you how easy this is. In this track, we have a car. This car is actually some sort of dozer. It's not actually. <laughs> uh, so it's a self-driving dozer more than it's a self-driving car. We're going to make this self-drive around the track, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to do that. So the first thing I'm going to show you is I have made this car. This is basically a game. Okay, So if I hit play now, assuming I set everything up correctly earlier, you'll see that uh, this lets me drive around the track. Okay, This is me steering. I am very bad at steering. I cannot drive in the real world. I cannot drive on computers. Okay, So whoop, there we go. When you crash, it just resets you to the nearest point. Okay, So hopefully you all have seen a racing game before or played a racing game as, as exciting as this one. Uh, you can see that you know, we can drive around this track. It's very good. That's not very interesting from a machine learning point of view. So we're going to use machine learning to make the car drive itself. The way we're going to do that is we're going to make sure the car's camera is fed into some sort of machine learning system. So if you look at this car, if I expand it over here, you'll see that it has a camera mounted uh, to the front right here. And it points forward. So you can kind of see the, the view frustum of the camera. There's this like cone thing coming forward. And you can see the little preview down here of what the camera can see. So this camera is mounted to the front of the car. And if the car drives around the track, which I'll show you in a second, you'll see the, little, the camera at the front of the car is connected to it. Okay, So it's moving with the car. We're going to feed that camera into a machine learning system and teach the car to drive around the track by itself. The way we're going to do that is we're going to use these waypoints. If you look on the track, there's these orange things here, which are spaced around the track relatively evenly. Uh, I'll just manipulate my scene to show you those. So you can see one there. And then if I go forward, OK, so they're going around the track. When the car leaves the, the track and goes through one of these colliders on the outside, we reset to the nearest shiny yellow thing. OK, make sense to everyone? Pretty straightforward. Uh, that, that's code I'm not going to show you. Just trust me, that works. That's what was happening when I was crashing earlier. Now, I'm going to turn on some machine learning and show you how this works. But first, I'm going to show you the car's code. And if you don't like C Sharp, it's time to avert your eyes. I, I really like C Sharp. It's actually grown, grown on me a lot years, the, over the years. It's one of my favorite languages. It's not suitable for the same things Python's suitable for, but it's a very good language in its own right. So I'm going to open the car's code. And this is the code attached to the car itself. So there's a lot of junk here, because Unity is a game engine and comes with a lot of baggage, because it's a game engine. Basically, we have, we have a system that simulates a car. So if I look back in Unity for a second, you'll see on our car, there's a whole bunch of parameters over here that you know, relate to cars. Because if you want to build a car game, you need all these parameters. When we're not using most of them. In fact, the car automatically steers forward, drives forward, it accelerates. And we have the only control we have is left and right. Because we don't want to make a machine learning bot that takes too, too long to train. So if I go back to the code, you'll see we have all, that, all the junk to set that up. The most important thing here is this agent action thing, which is a thing we implement to adhere to the requirements of this ML agents toolkit. And this agent action says, when this act action comes in, we either go left or right. It's either going to be minus one or one. And we tell the car to move with that action. That's all that's doing. Okay? And then we check if we're collided. So if we've hit something, if we've gone outside the edge of the track, we penalize the car with a minus one floating point, And we reset the car to its nearest point. And if we did not hit something, we give the car a very tiny reward. <laughs> very small reward. Very large penalty. Okay? It's really important that you tune these numbers. These numbers are more 
up and they are science. If anyone's done any machine learning, you'll know that this kind of takes a while to get right. This is something that we came up with that kind of works okay. okay? Uh, yeah, there's a collect observations thing here, which allows us to pass information about the scene into the machine learning system. We can give any sort of vector input we want in here. So if we wanted to measure the distance from the walls, we could send invisible lasers called raycasts in the video game world out into the walls and measure how far away those are. We're not going to do that here. We're actually going to use visual observations, so we're just using that camera on the front, and that's a thing we can set up visually inside Unity. So here we have an agent action. The car can steer left or right, minus 101. And if it hits something, it gets penalized. If it's still driving, it gets a small reward. OK? That's literally it. Uh, back in Unity, you'll see we have our camera attached to the car. And we have this thing called a car academy, which is the thing that just mediates between the ability to learn and the ability to control Unity. And here we have a learning brain. I'm going to click Control on this learning brain. This means we're using an interprocess bridge to talk to Python. That's all that control text tick box does. And if I show you the, the contents of that brain, you'll see that it has a visual observation of 32 by 24 in grayscale. And that's that camera attached to the car. Okay? That's, that's literally it. And it has a space type, uh, space size of one, 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 one action, which basically means that vector has one thing inside it, which is a minus one or a one. That's literally it. Okay? That's the only setup we need to do in Unity. So uh, I'm actually, no, I lie. There's one more thing I need to do. Uh, there's this. If I connect the learning brain to the car. I had a player brain there before, which allows me to drive the car with keys. So this is what a player brain looks like. A player brain just exists so you can use the machine learning subsystem to test your world and drive it around with the keyboard. So I had exactly the same setup here, but it was mapped to <laughs> keys. Apologies for sniffing. It's been a long week. Uh, so now we've set the car to use the learning brain. Uh, we're going to go into a Python script. Very exciting. First thing I'm going to show you, though, is some hyperparameters. All machine learning needs hyperparameters. Very straightforward. Lots of magic numbers. Don't worry about it. OK? <laughs> Has anyone done machine learning and familiar with what I'm talking about? OK, yep. Hyperparameters, lots of magic numbers. These have been tuned over the last few weeks of us iterating on this project to get it right. More interestingly, we're using a trainer called PPO, which is called Proximal Policy Optimization. It's a very generic but useful machine learning algorithm that kind of does lots of things kind of well. It's not perfect for all situations, though. Uh, and here we have a specific set of parameters for our car. That's really it. OK, so I'm going to fire up this Python script, and I'm going to show you how this can work with more interesting Python. I'm going to run this Python command mlagents-learn, which is just a nice wrapper around PPO. I'm going to point it to our YAML file, and I'm going to give it an ID. OK? So that's going to fire up Unity's ML agents and then ask us to push play in the Unity editor. OK, start training by pressing play. So if I push play in Unity, this will start training. TensorFlow will complain, because that's what TensorFlow does. <laughs> and then eventually, it will start training with a bit of luck. Again, this is very exciting. There we go. OK, so you can see here, I'm going to shrink that a little bit. This is training and slowly getting a reward. What this is doing is taking completely random actions in that minus one to one action space and seeing how it's rewarded or penalized. Okay, if I go back to Unity, it will be lagging, but it will be kind of driving. So you'll see it's moving the car around. When it gets penalized, it gets penalized. When it gets rewarded, it gets rewarded. And we can see that reward happening here. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, TensorBoard from more serious machine learning projects, you can use that as well. So if I go here and fire that up, you can see here this is all over the place right now because it's really early in its training run. But it, it does show you what's going on. So you want the reward to go up slowly over time. This is reinforcement learning. So we're pairing actions with observations and rewards and trying to guide it towards an optimal policy of driving. Now, realistically, this will take you know, 10 or so hours if we're leaving it to train on my computer to get somewhere. We haven't got that much time, so I'm going to show you one I've prepared earlier, because that's what we do. So I'm going to kill that. You'll see here it wrote out an NN file, which is just a neural net from TensorFlow. That's a, a PB file. I already have one of those, so I'm just going to show you how it works. Very exciting. I'm going to go back into Unity. And I'm going to go onto my brain, which is our learning brain here. And you'll see here we've got a slot for a model. And I've got one I prepared earlier, which is this one. We want it to infer on the GPU. This is actually not a problem, not, not the kind of situation we'd want to actually use a GPU for, but I'm going to leave it alone. And then I'm going to turn off that control thing because we don't want Python to control it. Unity does not use Python for inference. It only uses Python for training. 
And I'll show you some more Python in a second for those of you who prefer Python to C-sharp things. I'm going to click play now. This brain was trained for about a day. And you'll see it's driving itself. It's as bad as I am, basically, at this point. But it is at least driving itself, which is a positive thing. That's very good. That's very interesting. We can make a game. That's really fun. Now, that's not the fun bit, OK? Python is the fun bit. So that's great. We made it work. But if I turn this control thing back on and remove the brain, remove the model from the brain, and go into Jupyter. So I have Jupyter running here. Everyone loves Jupyter. Uh, I'm going to run some code here. I'm going to zoom in so you can see it. I'm going to say train mode true. I'm going to run that. I'm going to run some Python code. So we're going to import matplot, numpy, pill, the usual stuff. And we're going to import some stuff from Unity. OK, so I'm going to run that one as well. I'm going to just check the Python version is correct. Machine learning mostly, often, usually kind of requires Python 3.6. Don't worry about it. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later if you have a question. Um, uh, I'm now going to ask Unity to give me a handle on its environment. You'll see this message we saw before, start training by pressing play in Unity. So if I go back to Unity and hit play, and then come back here, you'll see it gets a handle on the, the environment here. And it knows there's a learning brain with one visual observation, no vector observation, so there's no numbers being fed into it, only that one visual observation. Uh, and it has an action space of one, OK? So it can take that minus one or one action. There's also the player brain, which is the thing I was using to steer it with the keyboard. It can see them both. Now we can uh, grab a handle on that and just make sure we've got it. So yep, we've got a handle on the learning brain here. I can now have a look at that environment and print it out. So there's no vector observations, but I can see out that camera. So that's my 32 by 24 grayscale camera coming out of Unity. I can keep running that so I can get more of if it was moving. You know, It's very, very interesting. But now I can take random actions in that environment. So here I am using Python to basically say, take a random step using that continuous action range, so minus 1 to 1 in our environment, and do it 10 times. And if I click Play, you'll see I can spit this out in Jupyter here. And this basically means you have complete control of Unity from within Python, and you can make it do your bidding. You can ignore the machine learning side if you want and just use this to control Unity and build a simulation. I know lots of people are using Unity to build environments that are high enough fidelity representations of the real world. Then they're using Unity cameras to capture images of that and using it to train machine learning for things that work in the real world, completely unrelated to the simulation. So if you need a really high fidelity simulation and you want to capture it with Python, this is a really good solution for that. This is kind of mind-blowingly useful. And when we finish, we close the environment, which disconnects it and releases Unity back to us. So this is a really useful thing if you need to do something with machine learning. So I'm not going to go into any more depth about the Python stuff. There's a really good Python API that lets you uh, go through everything, this thing. So there's a full API here that you can use to uh, basically figure out whatever you want to do. And there's a big Python API here, which lets you grab stuff from the Unity environment. So you can ignore the machine learning side and just use this to control Unity, which is something I recommend you start with. The thing I want to show you next in my last 10 minutes or so is how ridiculous this can get. So this is an environment that we didn't build, but I think is really cool. So if you've ever seen the, uh, those ridiculous walking demos where the things make themselves walk, you can implement that yourself. So this, <laughs> this thing has taught itself to walk, <laughs> kind of. This is about 12 hours of training, because I didn't have time. Because my computer bricked itself yesterday or the day before, so I had to retrain all these. This is about 12 hours of training. This thing, uh, I pull up the docs because I keep forgetting this thing. This thing has, uh, this thing has 26 degrees of freedom on a whole bunch of body parts. Hips, chest, spine, head, thighs, shins, feet, arms, forearms, and hands. Its goal is to move towards the goal direction. And it gets rewarded for veloci uh, velocity in the goal direction. Head position up, so staying upright. <laughs> uh, body direction alignment with goal, so it's not veering off its goal. And it gets penalized for head velocity difference from body velocity. <laughs> so you know, that's basically how humans walk, if you unpack it. That's not, that's, not, that's not meant to be funny. That is how humans walk. And it gets uh, observation space from the, the world it's, it's in. So it, can see the rotation velocity, angular velocity, and the position of all of those 215 different variables of its joints. That basically means it ends up doing this, because it's not, it's not really walking so much as it's kind of flinging itself in, in the direction of where it needs to be. <laughs> However, this has not been animated. 
and you can build anything you like using a system like this. So I'm just going to unpack this a little bit more for you because I think it's worth learning. So I still have 10 minutes left. I think I'll show you one more thing. We've built a little warehouse. Okay, so this is a little warehouse with a little robot in it. This robot needs to push this cube into the goal over here. Okay, so we've given this robot lasers. He has perfect lasers that can show where he needs to be. So his lasers are these things. So if you see here, he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lasers going out at different angles around his body. He can detect the crate. He can detect the goal he needs to get to, and he knows what's a wall. And he sends those, that set of lasers out twice, one at one level and one at another level. Okay? He gets rewarded. Uh, sorry, he gets penalized for every single move he makes, <laughs> which is designed to make him take economy of movement. So he's designed to, he needs to take as minimal steps as possible to achieve his goal. Uh, and when he delivers his package to the correct place, he gets five. Okay? So this is him, this is him going. And you can see the lasers flashing. I can turn those off. Those are not part of the environment. But you see the little guy pushing it around. He's pretty good at his job, right? But we can make him really confused really quickly, which kind of demonstrates how and why machine learning does what it does. So we could code this pretty quickly if we were just coding this as a heuristic. But this is learnt to push this around. So if I open a different version of the warehouse where there's multiple goals of different colors and multiple crates, but leave the machine learning brain exactly the same, he's going to freak out. So if you don't feel comfortable seeing a robot freak out, now is the time to look away. This robot knows that he needs to push crates into goals, but he doesn't have any concept of color. So he just rapidly gets very stressed. He'll occasionally do something correct. <laughs> he, doesn't know, he doesn't know why he's getting, he's basically getting hit every time <laughs> something happens here. Uh, if he gets punished too much, the environment resets itself, so you may see everything disappear. Uh, basically, if he fails too much, we kill him. Um, I'm going to put him out of his misery, but before I put him out of his misery, I'm just going to show you one quick, really sad thing. There's actually hundreds of them. <laughs> All going at once. It's because when you do machine learning, you want to train in parallel, so the more information you can feed into the brain, the better. So often these environments are duplicated repeatedly. So. This is just a really quick taster of what you can do. If you, Unity is completely free if you're not using it to build video games and making over $100,000. It's not open source. The Python bridge lets you pretty much control anything you like within Unity and comes with a bunch of scripts that allow you to train things that do all sorts of stuff without having to think about it much. So if you're interested in learning about machine learning, this is a very accessible way to getting into it. It uses TensorFlow. It uses all the industry standard, de facto standards for this stuff. So you're learning real useful skills, and you're doing it in a really visual way. Okay, you could even visualize just a regular old neural network, but put it in a visual form so you can see what's going on. So we teach a lot of children how to do machine learning with this, and they instantly grasp it when they can see it moving. And it's really un uh, open people's eyes like nothing else. I'm going to show you one other thing. I'm just going to give you a bit of a content warning before I show you. It looks like a spider to some extent. So if you do not like spiders, you might want to look away. It's not very spider-like. It just has lots of legs. Okay? So that is your warning. Here is our spider. It's going to clear those errors. OK, so this is a spider bot that has taught itself to walk. We built this one. It, it is, uh, it is, its goal is to follow that, that orange cube around. The orange cube is just moving around the environment randomly. The spider knows where it is, uh, but doesn't know much else. It can be hit by it. Now, it gets uh, rewarded for facing it and approaching it and getting close to it. It gets penalized for pretty much everything else. Uh, and it's taught itself to walk. So this is a pretty simple example pretty straightforward. But we thought, you know, video game engine, we need to make this more something a gamer would like. So we gave the spider bot a gun. <laughs> uh, so here is our spider bot, and here's our gun mount, which I've turned off. I'm just going to turn the gun mount on. So the gun is actually a completely separate AI agent that is sitting on top of the spider. So it's effectively a spider bot with a parasitic gun on top. <laughs> They're both controlled by com two completely separate machine learning brains that were trained with Python. The bot is designed to seek the cube. The gun is designed to kill the cube. And they work together. So you'll see he's got a gun now. <laughs> I 
it's pretty efficient. So we did this. We did a version of this at PAX, the Penny Arcade Expo, which is a consumer gaming show where we were trying to explain how machine learning works to video gamers with a capital video game. And they, we, uh, we hooked this up to a controller so they could also play the robot and attempt to destroy the cube quicker than the bot. And in the 30 seconds we let them play, the bot killed the cube 60 times and the human killed it twice. <laughs> so the machine overlords will win eventually. But this is about... This is about an hour's worth of work in, in Python and Unity to get this going, excluding the, the visual aspects. The thing I really want to show you before I finish is that this behavior is embedded in the object. So if I go here and I duplicate the robot without doing anything else, and just move it slightly so there's a couple of robots, duplicate it again, duplicate it again, <laughs> right? So there's a couple of robots there, and run this. There's now more than one robot in the environment, in theory. <laughs> there we are. So our camera is designed to track the main robots. I'll just uh, go into the scene here. <laughs> they have no concept of each other existing, but they know each other exists in the physics engine. So if you have enough of them, they'll eventually make a big pile of robots where one will ascend to the top. <laughs> they, will, they will use the others as a platform with which to shoot the cube, and then they'll just stay in this big juddering, juddering spider bot pile. It's horrifying. <laughs> it's legitimately horrifying. So I'm going to show you one more, one more thing quickly, because I've still got three minutes left. So this is another Unity demo that we didn't make. Uh, it's this Unity. So I have lots of Unities open. Uh, this is Tennis. So this is Tennis, which is two hands, which are robots, trained with Python that can play tennis. OK? And the fun thing about this one is you can do imitation learning or behavior cloning. So you can hook one hand up to a human and have the other one learn how to play the tennis based on the human instead of based on reward signals. So you can do behavioral cloning uh, online, behavioral cloning, which is real time, using this algorithm. And then you can feed all the information into Python and tweak it to your heart's content. So that's Unity with machine learning for Python. I'm going to go back to my slides and quickly finish. Uh, I'm going to jump to here. So. The brain is the thing that encapsulates logic. You can swap a brain out for being controlled by a human, or you can route your brain to Python to be controlled by either a neural net you've trained or for training purposes. It's really powerful. The agent is the thing inside Unity, which is the thing you're controlling with your brain. It assigns rewards. It's linked to a brain. It performs actions. Okay, so the agent in this case was the robot, the hands, the spider bot, the car. Hopefully that makes sense. And these three objects exist inside Unity and then talk to Python to let you do the training. Okay. What we saw was reinforcement learning today, but you can also do imitation learning, as I said, which is the behavioral cloning thing where you teach it as a human what to do. Really, really powerful stuff can come out of this. So the reinforcement learning we did today was actions, observations, and rewards. We had some actions we wanted to do, which we rewarded based on you know, how it went, and then we got certain observations to, to generate those rewards or not. Actions are just a number, so you know you can handle that however you like in your game engine. As you saw, I was taking minus one for one direction and one for the other direction when we had the car, but it can be whatever. Observations can be vectors, so you can you know distance to a thing or a count or a number, or be pictures coming from Unity's cameras. Rewards are just more numbers. Okay. Reinforcement learning is just this cycle of learning until you converge on an optimal policy where it can actually do the thing you want it to do. Brain Academy Agent. This is how it looks. TensorFlow is communicating down the bottom. When you build an environment, you kind of want to think about how you construct it. This is pretty straightforward stuff. Coming up with the actions and observations is the really tricky bit. That's the art, not the science. I recommend using the Python bridge to start with uh, via the Unity ML agents learn script, which is the pre-made things, and then moving to using Jupyter and doing it yourself. But you'll come up with the process. Here's what you need. You need Unity. You can get it from here. It's really cool. It's mostly free. Build a simulation with the self-driving car. You play it like a game. Make it make sure it works. You also need Python. I like Anaconda, but you can use whatever environment you like. And you need a very specific version of TensorFlow because mutter, mutter, machine learning, something. Uh, and then you need ML agents, which you can get from pip. That's pretty much it. Uh, I really, really, really like this. Uh, I think a game engine is a really great way to learn machine learning, and I hope you try it out. Uh, if you're interested in doing this with a completely open source game engine, there's a game engine called Godot, G-O-D. T-O, G-O-D-O-T, uh, which is open source, completely free, and has a similar project in the works, which works with TensorFlow as well. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Paris.